What's up, Colt? My name is Jack Neal, and welcome back to my YouTube channel, where we cover all things horrifying, wicked, and morbid. Today, we have three unique cases that all have similar themes, but gradually get more disturbing. If you haven't already, make sure to murder that like button, or else. Let's get into today's video. And don't forget, look behind you. Lacey Spears is a seemingly ordinary girl from Decatur, Alabama who loves American Girl dolls. Her and her best friend Jessica love to pretend like they're the doll's mothers, but Lacey takes it a bit too far. She takes her doll everywhere. Whether it's walking down the sidewalk or getting groceries from the store, she acts like the doll is her own child. See, from a young age, Lacey lives with Jessica and her family because in her own home, she's a victim of abuse. She's deprived any kind of love from her parents, so she begins calling Jessica's mother mom and starts conjuring up elaborate stories for attention. Lie after lie, Lacey tries to compensate for her low self-esteem, and that's when she starts to babysit a boy named Jonathan. His mother soon finds out that Lacey's been posting photos of him on MySpace, claiming to be his mom. And then there's Cameron. Another boy Lacey babysits and pretends to be her own until the mother catches her and fires her. Finally, we get to Garnett Spears, Lacey's biological son who enters the world on December 3rd, 2008. His father, Blake, is a police officer who gets in a car accident and is killed just before Garnett's born. However, just a few days after Lacey leaves the hospital with her newborn baby, Garnett begins to develop issues with dehydration and malnutrition. Multiple medical tests are performed to get to the bottom of his condition, but the only thing that doctors can find is a high amount of sodium in Garnett's blood. Over the first year of his life, Garnett is hospitalized 23 times and Lacey takes to social media as an outlet for her grief. One post in particular highlights how Garnett is not receiving the proper nutrition he needs to survive, so doctors resort to surgically inserting a feeding tube into his stomach, and it's this decision that will later prove fatal. Now, feeding tubes are typically administered in the hospital, but in Garnett's case, all other solution or cures have been tried, so the doctors make an exception to let Lacey have control over it in her own home. As time goes on and Garnett's condition gradually improves, Lacey is extremely reluctant to remove the tube despite physicians telling her that he no longer needs it. And every time a doctor suggests that the feeding tube be removed, Lacey simply sees a new doctor, one that isn't familiar with Garnett's medical history. It appears that when Garnett's under medical care, his symptoms gradually fade away, but when he returns back home with his mom, the conditions start to come back. Simultaneously with each hospital visit, the story of Garnett is growing, and as his story grows, so do Lacey's supporters. Their online posts suggest they began including the frustrated, struggling mother in their thoughts and prayers, and celebrated when Garnett ultimately overcame condition after condition after... What's going on here? A question that starts to be answered on January 19th, 2014, when Garnett, who's now five years old, is airlifted to Westchester Medical Center. At first, the boy's treated and he's recovering well, but out of nowhere, Garnett's declared brain dead, put on life support, and dies just four days later. But as he was on life support, the only thing doctors could find is a high amount of sodium in the boy's blood. Police investigations lead to Lacey's neighbor, who says that as Garnett was on the brink of death, she had received a phone call from his mother requesting that she remove his feeding bag and throw it in the trash. She did as Lacey said, but ultimately hands the bag over to the police who note that the bag has the sodium equivalent of 69 McDonald's salt packets. Investigators also uncover video footage from the hospital that shows Garnett acting perfectly normal and quite energetic before Lacey takes him to the bathroom where he returns in pain, burrowing his head into the hospital bed. These two crucial pieces of evidence ultimately lead prosecutors to convicting Lacey of the murder of Garnett Spears via his feeding tube. And as it turns out, she's been lying about everything. From his first illness to his last, from the blog post to the status updates, even the story of Garnett's father who died in an accident, it's all a story. A story that Lacey, a struggling girl with low self-esteem, made up for attention. Attention that she craved so badly that she murdered her own son to get it. Lacey's given a sentence of 20 years to life for her crimes, and today complains of fellow inmates tormenting her by pouring salt packets on her food before serving it.
It's July 27, 1991. Claudine Blanchard, nicknamed Dee Dee, has a child with her husband Rod, who's 17. They name the baby girl Gypsy Rose. Gypsy because Dee Dee simply likes the name, and Rose because Rod is a huge fan of Guns N' Roses. As time goes on, Rod realizes that he got married for the wrong reasons, so he divorces Dee Dee and remarries another woman, ultimately becoming less involved in his daughter's life. By all appearances though, Gypsy Rose is a beautiful, healthy baby that is until three months later when her health issues begin. First, it's sleep apnea, then a mysterious chromosomal disorder, muscular dystrophy, and at the age of eight she gets in a motorcycle accident with her grandfather and is forced to use a wheelchair. Gypsy and Dee Dee are a symbol of conquering adversity in their small town of Chack Bay, Louisiana. However, her illnesses and mental disabilities get so severe that Dee Dee starts homeschooling Gypsy and she's cut off from her community. It's at about this time that she starts having seizures, and just when things couldn't get any worse, the two get caught up in Hurricane Katrina. Homeless and with no place to go, the two are stat flighted to Dee Dee's hometown of Springfield, Missouri, and there the story of a single mom fighting to raise a daughter with severe disabilities, being forced to flee the devastation caused by a hurricane, gains mass media attention. The community empathizes with Gypsy and praises Dee Dee for her resilient efforts. A mix of charitable donations, disability payments, and child support from Rod Blanchard allow the two to rebuild their lives and purchase a home in Missouri. Dee Dee and Gypsy receive free flights to see doctors at Children's Mercy Hospital, free trips to Disneyland, and the Make-A-Wish Foundation gives them backstage passes to see country singer Miranda Lambert. Despite the support Gypsy receives from the local community of Springfield, she's heavily sheltered by her mother who by all appearances is her only friend. Gypsy's only had one short-lived romantic relationship that her mother did not approve of, so she secretly goes on a dating site for Christian singles. She makes a profile, and it's there that she meets Nick Godajohn, a boy roughly the same age as Gypsy from Wisconsin. He, like Gypsy, has various learning differences, and his social skills aren't fully developed. Gypsy keeps the relationship hidden from her mother, but tells her neighbor Aaliyah, who she considers to be a big sister. She confesses that she and Nick are getting married and she already has the names picked out for her future children. Aaliyah tries to convince Gypsy that this isn't the best idea because she's far too young and Nick could potentially be a sexual predator, but she doesn't listen. Their relationship continues on for another year digitally before Gypsy and Nick arrange to meet in person. He flies out to see Gypsy in Springfield where the lovers meet in secret and together they make a plan. Eventually, Nick comes back to Missouri in June 2015 and arrives at Gypsy and Dee Dee's house while they're away at a doctor's appointment. They return late at night, Dee Dee goes to bed, and Gypsy lets Nick into the house. She then wheels herself into the bathroom, and that's when she hears screams calling for her name. Nick is brutally attacking her mother. He stabs Dee Dee in the back 17 times and posts the following status update to her Facebook page. That bitch is dead. At first, people think Dee Dee's been hacked until a subsequent post is made minutes later. I'm not going to read it aloud because it's grisly, but it's something along the lines of stabbing Dee Dee and sexually assaulting her daughter. It's then that the neighbors suspect something is wrong, so they call for a wellness check, and when they arrive, Dee Dee comes out on a stretcher with a white sheet over her body, and Gypsy is missing. Police trace the IP address of the person who made the Facebook post to a home in Big Bend, Wisconsin. And to no surprise, it's the home of Gypsy's boyfriend, Nick Godajar. They send a SWAT team into the house and take both Nick and Gypsy into custody. And you're probably wondering why is Gypsy being taken into custody? Her mother's just been murdered and she's the victim of a kidnapping, but as it turns out, Gypsy's the one who handed Nick the knife that killed Dee Dee Blanchard. Things are not what they seem. Since Gypsy's birth, Dee Dee has been making up medical conditions, and when a doctor doesn't believe her, she simply sees another doctor. Gypsy undergoes surgery after surgery for fake conditions or ones brought on by Dee Dee's manipulation. Gypsy doesn't even need a wheelchair, and she can walk perfectly fine. Dee Dee also lies to her about her age, and whenever Gypsy objects to any of these claims, she receives mental, physical, and psychological torment. Dee Dee even went as far as shaving Gypsy's head to simulate chemotherapy treatment. A classic case of Munchausen by proxy. 
Her boyfriend Nick is sentenced to life in prison for first degree murder and despite everything that Gypsy Rose has gone through, she is convicted of second degree murder and receives a 10 year sentence. However, she claims that in prison she feels freer than she ever did living with her mom because now she can live like a normal woman. At this point in the video, you may have realized that all the mothers in these stories have a condition called Munchausen by proxy. If you're not familiar with the term, essentially it's when a child's primary caregiver, typically a mother, fakes a terminal illness in order to gain fame, money, or simply empathy. While Munchausen by proxy has been around for quite some time, it definitely manifests itself differently in today's social media world. The final story is from a mother who's believed to have the most severe case of Munchausen by proxy and is prior to the time of social media. It's 1961 and a teenage girl named Mary Beth has just graduated high school and is looking for her place in the world. And this is no easy task for a quiet, insecure woman who always tends to fade in the background. However, after working several low-wage jobs, she manages to become a nursing assistant at Ellis Hospital in New York. A few years after working there, Mary Beth is seeking a relationship so she goes on a blind date with a happy-go-lucky guy named Joseph Tenning. Things go smoothly and in 1965 the two get married and have three children together. Barbara, Joey, and Jennifer. Right after her birth, the youngest Jennifer develops meningitis and multiple brain diseases and dies at only 8 days old on January 3rd, 1972. However, Mary Beth Tenning does not shed a tear over the death of her daughter because she's preoccupied with the attention and sympathy she receives from both her family and the hospital staff. Despite her being seen dry-eyed and emotionless at Jennifer's funeral, no one dares to accuse a mother who has just lost a child of not mourning properly. They think perhaps Mary Beth is just in deep shock and copes differently from most. But just 17 days after Jennifer's death, Mary Beth rushes her middle child Joey to the hospital because he's apparently experienced a seizure and had choked on his own vomit. However, after careful observations over the course of several days, the hospital releases Joey as there's seemingly nothing wrong with him. Though just a few hours later, Mary Beth returns back to the hospital carrying a lifeless Joey in her arms. The boy's death is labeled a heart attack and no autopsy of the body is performed. Over the next 13 years, Mary Beth Tenning has five more of her own children and adopts a son, and it just so happens that every single one of these children loses their lives under Mary Beth's care. Suspicions are raised about what's really going on in the Tenning household, but all the children's deaths are believed to be caused by some rare genetic disorder. However, this theory is finally overturned when their adoptive son Michael, who doesn't share the same DNA as his siblings, dies in 1981. But still, it takes four more years and the death of another child before the truth finally comes out. On December 20th, 1985, Mary Beth and Joseph's ninth child, four-month-old Tammy Lynn, dies mysteriously. At this point, authorities finally put two and two together and decide to bring Mary Beth to the station for questioning. While she doesn't admit to any wrongdoing at first, after a few hours, Mary Beth begins to break down and describe the horrors that she put her children through. In the end, she's arrested after giving a 36-page confession in which she admits to smothering Tammy Lynn, Timothy, and Nathan. However, Mary Beth continuously denies any responsibility for the deaths of her other children. In the confession, she even admits to once poisoning her husband Joseph after an argument where afterward he'd been sent to the hospital and survived. Nevertheless, it's now believed that Mary Beth, like the other mothers in our stories, suffers from Munchausen by proxy. It's believed that she developed it after the death of her first child and was addicted to the attention she received. This ultimately led to her becoming a sympathy junkie at the expense of her own children. And despite multiple victims, Mary Beth Tenning is only charged for the murder of her ninth child, Tammy Lynn, and is sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. However, after seven attempts at parole, in 2018 she's released from prison and is currently living with her husband in New York. My name's Jack Neal, and stay spooky, YouTube.